And how long do I hang for? We usually do about an hour or so. All right. Um, up to you if you want to be here longer, if you need I'm to easy. Be, be gone and whatever. Uh, hopefully Nick uh, appears soon. Um, we got two people on right now. And, and we'll wait a couple minutes or so. But yeah, that... We've done. You saw which one did you see? Uh, Mario, right? yeah, someone Mario. Yeah, so I mean that kind of is the gist of it. Is we just introduce you, okay? Introduce yourself. You know who you are and any important uh, things you want to say, and then we'll just start talking. And then cool. You know, if anything you say makes me think of a question, I'll ask something. Same with Nick. You know, if something comes up, we'll ask. Okay. It's so, not just all right. talk. I could do yeah. that. Hopefully Nick shows up. I don't, I don't know what happened to him. <laughs> well, he said he was going to be here on time. Yeah. Unless he got caught up with someone like Craig. Let's see. Trying to... Seems about right. And then if you have any particular ship you want me to play. <laughs> we, we, so we got lucky with this account. They, we have like everything, or close to everything. Really? So we have two hundred and seven ships. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was watching a lot of Mighty Jingles. Yeah. Uh, his reviews. Mm. <clears throat> well, actually, when I was over in England, I, I sent a note to him mm -hmm. in case he wanted to get a beer. Yeah. Um, I was kind of hoping to to hear from Rear Admiral Jingles in person <laughs> because he's the one who's taught me about this. Yeah. Game. And then they just released the uh, French uh, battleship, so we got to work our way through those. Hmm. We didn't and those. I, I'm assuming most of these French battleships are f the fictional variety. The if they built more battleships, yeah, yeah. bad and older. Yeah, these are all designed. <clears throat> this one was in service. In service. In service. So these. That one was designed. So yeah. Yeah, these are all designed, never in service. Yeah, I'm kind of, I'm kind of compulsive in mm -hmm. that I don't like the idea of multinational ships playing on the same team. Yeah, yeah. I, I can't hack that. Yeah. I, I don't. I know. I know. I'm just not getting yeah. the point. That it's, <laughs> the game is totally cool. Yeah. But I, I'd like to have a version. <laughs> yeah. Where I mean, at least can... my team will all be Italians or yeah. whatever, and we'll all be against the. Uh, if we set up French. a. Uh, a training <laughs> scenario. You you can make the conditions of stuff like oh, that. Oh, can like you really? You can really? only you have this say, nation or whatever. Yeah. Um, if we had a couple more people playing with us, or if we we thought we could actually fill up a room quickly enough, that that would be something to do. Oh, well, maybe maybe uh, someday. Yeah. I'll uh, um, get see. brave. Yeah. Uh, Chris uh, Nelson Security yeah. is playing. Yeah. Troy is playing. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. so we got a few people going now. So see, like restrictions, you can. You can do that. I don't know if you can do it per team, though. I've got to figure that out. Yeah, I want them to be slightly historically plausible. Yeah. Actually, what I'd like to do is uh, get the entire fleet from uh, Pearl Harbor mm -hmm. and go up against the IJN fleet mm -hmm. and just do it that way. <laughs> by God, it's the Maryland and the yeah. Arizona and all those. <laughs> all right, so let's get started. Um Go ahead and introduce yourself. Okay, um, I'm Chris Butler, uh, not a former naval person. I'm actually here as uh, one of the education staff uh, focusing on science and engineering. That's what I do on board. I help with the education. Uh, but I'm also a maritime historian and artist. And so I'm involved with uh, uh, teaching the maritime and naval history aspect of the ship in a broader context than just having been involved in this one ship. And I've been involved with her since day one. I rode her up to be towed at this, towed to this exact spot. So, so even in my, in my my hat, I wrote proudly the date June 9th, twenty twelve is in my hat to prove I was here first day. <laughs> but uh, and I've been here ever since. So that's me. All right. So. 2012 with the Iowa. You've also yep. worked on the Queen Mary. Yeah, I was tour guide there? on the Queen Mary. Um, 
there are a few people here involved yeah. with the Iowa who also were involved with Queen Mary, anybody who's interested in ships. So naturally, we would be involved in that too. Um, I was involved with the Queen Mary, gosh, since I was a little kid, running around her since <laughs> I was eight. And that was, uh, that was my world, was evading security guards and getting into every <laughs> single place on the ship. Um, my, my proud boast today is I've been everywhere in the Queen Mary except the crow's nest, and only because I chickened out. <laughs> and the rudder, only because uh, you can't get inside unless they put her in dry dock. There are three decks inside the rudder. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's, there's a lot of wow. Yeah, you know, that's about. awesome. I mean, this ship is huge, but you know that yeah. it's it's even slightly well, noticeably bigger. Yeah, uh, and that's one of the things you wouldn't want that kind of rudder on this ship because a hollow rudder with three decks inside it is flimsy. Yeah, and subject to damage. So that, that that's kind of an interesting thing for me is the difference between ocean liners and warships, and <clears throat> I have my ocean liner friends from like the Steamship Historical Society, of which I'm a member. And it, it's kind of funny. There's a, a back-and-forth snobbery between those two worlds <laughs> where my ocean liner friends think I'm, I've, I've kind of defected to the dark side by being involved with a naval vessel. Yeah. And then there's the naval people who would look say, oh, the Queen Mary, oh, it's just an ocean liner. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> what kind of guns are on that ship, yeah. you know? Um, so, but they're, they're a little bit different worlds, but... Um, I, I find, actually, that the Iowa has so much in common with what I grew up with on the Queen Mary uh, that I totally recognize where I am. I, I speak her language. Yeah. And in saying that ocean liners and battleships have a lot in common, I've succeeded in one sentence in offending both camps. <laughs> totally. Um, but, uh, no, the heart of the Iowa and the heart of the Queen Mary are actually very similar. They just, they're just they like a horse if you were really into horses and you had a horse that was pulling a load of hay and then you had a horse that was carrying a knight on its back if you're into horses you totally recognize oh I get the horse part yeah and um, when I used to be uh, on the Queen Mary my whole world was the engine room and then down below we called ourselves the e-deck club <laughs> um, and we were not the hotel and fancy parties yeah. and, you know, the wine and cheese kind of people. We were like the uh, uh, the below deck, well, they called it called us rivet heads. And this ship is totally like a Queen Mary where you took all the fancy hotel stuff off the top yeah. and just stripped it away. Um, but all of this is, is totally recognizable. And the other part of it that's... Um, a joy. I mean, I, I bore people here talking about it, um, but the uh, the difference between the Queen Mary and here is that things get fixed and things still work. Yeah. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, like the deck and stuff like that. I mean, a lot of our deck here needs yeah. rework and replacement, of course, but it's getting reworked and replaced. And Things were super slow happening on the Queen Mary to the point where some stuff was starting to just fall apart, you know, and now they got a lot of problems because they're not taking care of her. But the Iowa is beautifully taken care of, and man, I just shake my head. I just, I love this. Yeah. It's funny because you were talking about the engineering. We had Marty here two weeks ago. Yeah. The Chief Marty. You, yeah. You sure. Know, yeah. Oh, yeah. And he's talking all about his time down there, run the engines. Uh, oh, but, totally. Uh, you, you know, actually, the very first um, uh, naval museum in Southern California I went to, because in addition to the Isle, we have the uh, Lane Victory, right? Yeah. So you got the cargo, the cargo ship. And I went there, and I was so excited to be in an engine room that still had all the stuff in it. That when I walked in there, I was amazed to hear a Scottish accent <laughs> from the bottom of the engine room. I'm yeah. hearing some Scotsman cussing something out, and I'm going, "This is bizarre! It's, that, yeah. it's totally like you know, Scotty in the engine room, Queen Mary kind of <laughs> stuff." So I went down there, and there was a guy, an older guy, and he was tearing apart the ship's turbo generator. He had it all laid out, 
And uh, he was, yeah, from Scotland. And I asked him, I said, well, how did you get here? What do you, what do you do in a U.S. Naval Museum? Yeah. And he said, oh, I came over on the Queen Mary. I was like, you put me on. And he said, yeah, he was in the engineering department there. And wow. when the ship, I mean, this is California. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody gets to California. Uh, the, the, the Queen Mary's crew jumped ashore. And if they knew somebody who would sponsor them, they could get a green card. And a huge number of them stayed. And they're still here in Southern California. Because wow. uh, they never wanted to leave. Yeah. And so this guy, because he was an engineer, it's like, where are you going to work? Oh, ship's engine room. Needs a guy to tear apart the turbo generator. He's going, oh, I know <laughs> that thing. So he jumped right in. But it was kind of bizarre. Yeah. Of course, here we've got experts in everything. Everything, right? Yeah. Mar Marty told his story about how he pulled the charts from the Transformers yeah. down there uh, when he first got called up to, to Richmond and Getch was like how long have these been here? Mm. <laughs> it was like something only he knew because he'd been on the ship sure so Queen Mary since you've been yep. a kid um, yep. Griffith as well right? yeah Griffith Observatory I've worked at now I mean I've visited Griffith since I was a kid uh, but I'm an amateur astronomer, I'm a science artist, that's my main living, um, and uh, I ended up signing on up at Griffith as an actual paid employee in 1997, so that makes it 21 years wow. that I've been there as an artist and animator, exhibit designer, that sort of thing. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I think I've been to Griffith once. Once and I, I don't remember if I actually went in. I think it might have been like closed. <laughs> no. I went late or something. You're not alone. I mean, I'm yeah. laughing for a reason yeah. because they did a survey there yeah. years ago about well, when you visited the Griffith Observatory, what did you like the most? And yeah. uh, they found out that three quarters of the people who visit yeah. do not enter the building. They get up. There's the Hollywood sign. Yeah. There's the James Dean, shrouded downtown. Yeah. Back on the bus. We'll yeah. Leave it. So they ended up having to put some things in the building to yeah. excite people and get them in. Is it, I'm trying to remember what I was up there for. It Probably might have been Lazarium. Like, Did you go up for no. Lazarium? I think I might have been like hiking around there or something. Oh, okay. And so I like, just got up there and looked around and then we okay. left. Okay, well, we're totally going to fix this. Yeah. Obviously, someday we're going to get you oh, inside. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you can see the other weird things that I do for a living when I'm not here. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's kind of funny because uh, so many of the places that I've worked, you know, I mean, the Queen Mary, there I would be sitting in my office on the Queen Mary, underwater, underneath the sewage <laughs> tanks, and thinking, I'm in a weird office. And then when I would go to work at Griffith, I'd be sitting there in my office, same time period notice, which is bizarre, because the Queen Mary debuts in 1936, the Griffith Observatory is from 1935, she's a year older. Yeah. And then, well, all right, let's break this up. I'm going to end up uh, getting into uh, uh, a different kind of living. So I get a job on a 1943 ocean liner. <laughs> I, I don't get this. I, I, I'd love to have a normal job, but I've just never had one. Yeah. It's always something bizarre. So I completely neglected the chat because I realized I didn't go back from the viewer list. So <laughs> if there are any questions there, I, I haven't looked at them since, like, we uh, started. Let me see if, uh, yeah, let's pop out the chat. Yeah, I have it up now, but I'm like... Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, I probably started a total bar fight with the whole... There's, <laughs> a, there's a lot of things in common between an ocean liner and a battleship. Yeah. Um, that's, that's usually enough to get people furious. And then, so on top of all those things, you also work for a cruise, cruise yeah, line, right? Yeah, well, actually, not not a cruise line, technically. Yeah. Um, uh, I work with uh, Kennard as a lecturer, a science lecturer, on board Queen Mary 2. So, that's that's an ocean liner. That's actually another one of those, you know, yeah, landmines you step on without meaning to. Yeah. The, the ocean liners and cruise ships are the same. Yeah. <laughs> totally not. Yeah. And that's where people start breaking the bar, the bottle on the bar, and coming after you. With the <laughs> um, no, a, a true ocean liners. There's actually only one on yeah. the earth at yeah. all, which is Queen Mary Two, that's still operating. You know. Yeah. And it's kind of funny 
because ocean liners, that difference between them and cruise ships is the same difference between a non-naval ship and a naval ship, which is strength and power. Yeah. So ocean liners are kind of already like halfway to being military vessels, real ocean liners. Yeah. So <clears throat> that's one of the reasons why the Iowa's heart is so much like the Mary's heart, is the uh, speed and horsepower. Because we've, we've got well in excess of 200,000 horses here. Um, uh, Queen Mary's engines were capable of 240,000. And Queen Mary 2, also being a true ocean liner, is capable of uh, 240,000 horses as well. Huh. And, 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 and this is another difference between an ocean liner and a, <laughs> um, uh, uh, something like a battleship. Uh, QM2 pulls off a trick this ship could never pull off. It's a great safety trick, but it could never do it for um, a warship. She has one engine room below the waterline that can drive her at about 22 knots, meaning cruise ship speed. But she has a second power plant at the base of the funnel well above the waterline. And that allows her to drive up to 30 knots. And the trick between those two is in the event of an emergency, if you've got flooding, you can actually use the engine room that's 11 stories over the water line. Yeah. <laughs> but you can't do that on a warship because putting half your engines up on the top makes yeah. them vulnerable. Right. So, you know, that's, that's a trick that people would have known when this ship was built and they would refuse to use. But splitting up the engines on this ship, which is one of the things they did by segregating the different parts of the engine, is the same trick. Just make her hard to kill. Yeah. So there was uh, one question that I saw before I popped out the chat, which made everything else go away. <laughs> um, and you kind of answered it already, which was, you know, what were the differences between an ocean, or where would you put a victory ship and the scale between a ocean liner and a warship? Uh, the, the World War II cargo ships were mass produced and their hulls were, of course, nowhere near strong enough to absorb huge poundings. Uh, they were built for, for mass production, large numbers needed, and that means that uh, those cargo vessels are almost not warships at all. Uh, they can't survive any kind of fighting. Uh, so it's a cargo ship with a defensive gun or two, couple anti-aircraft guns, whatever, on it. Uh, that made them incredibly vulnerable. Uh, and, of course, their crews were very brave accordingly because they were targets. But uh, uh, just about everything that would make an ocean liner, speed, uh, huge power reserves, all those things are not present in something like a, uh, a Liberty ship or a Victory ship. And then beyond that, all of the things that would make a ship, a warship, a battle ship, armament, all the rest of those things, uh, are almost not present as well. Really, they're, they're their own beast entirely. Yeah, very, very separate creature. Have you uh, gotten to the story of how you wound up on the QM2 yet? No, I haven't actually. Uh, <laughs> Which was funny, a couple years back, um, I guess about 1998, uh, Kennard announced that we're going to try to actually build another ocean liner. And for fans of ships, uh, the funny thing is you have people who like uh, battleships, for example, and the idea, will we ever build another battleship? An announcement coming out of the Navy saying, actually we are, we're going to build another battleship. We'll get the same reaction from everybody back home. Uh, that and them announcing an ocean liner got to me, which is first skepticism. Yeah. No way. You mean you, not <laughs> not not really, man, right? But let's say the Navy comes back. The Navy comes back and says, actually, yes, and it's going to have 30-inch guns, uh, laser weapons that can reach orbit. It'll be able to survive nuclear strikes at close distance. It'll make 60 knots and have a crew of 4,000 people. Really. <laughs> and then, you know, the first concept art comes out, something like that. Well, th this was actually, that process that started happening with this project. And they wouldn't say at first what even the project was called, but there'd yeah. be a new ocean liner. Then they announced the project was named Project Queen Mary. 
And then everybody kind of leaned forward in their chairs going, <laughs> you, you're messing with some serious magic here, yeah. dude. I mean, you really? And then the first artwork came out, and holy crud! We're talking about something the size of a nuclear aircraft carrier. And not a cruise ship. 30 knots worth of speed. Really fast. All the rest of this. And, of course, I was foaming at the mouth. I'm going, i got to get in this game. Somehow, I'm going to get involved. I've been yeah. involved with the Queen Mary all these years. I'm in the Steamship Historical Society. I can do this somehow. So I wrote a letter to uh, Cunard. And Cunard sent back a note. And, you know, i got to write to England, right? Yeah. And these guys come back with a, Oh, thank you for your interest in our 150-year-old company, kid. This is That's just really cute. <laughs> um, here, here's a little flyer if you'd ever like to book a cruise. And like, <laughs> I, I, I cannot book a cruise on the freaking Queen Mary. Um, so I ended up uh, doing this a couple times, getting shot down every time. And then amazingly, because everybody on the old Queen Mary knew I was doing, I'd do anything to get involved, yeah. right? And uh, a guy came by the, uh, the shops on the Queen Mary, and he wanted to buy a poster of a painting I had done of the old Queen Mary. And uh, so he buys it, and then amazingly the guy asks... Hey, what do you know about the artist? And thank God, thank God Martha was working in the shop that day because she knew me. And she said, well, actually, he's an astronomer. He lectures in science. And he'd give anything to lecture on the new Queen Mary. Uh, and he works at the Griffith Observatory Planetarium. And the new ship actually was going to have a planetarium on it, first one ever on hmm. a ship. The guy who bought the print happened to be the captain of the Queen Mary II. The captain. The freaking wow. captain. <laughs> and he buys this print. And uh, so he, he just says, well, I'll make a phone call. And he goes home. He makes that call. And wham, I got a letter from Kennard saying, Dear sir, we would be honored if you would join us. And so uh, I, didn't, I didn't care how it happened. I jumped in. And that was the ship's uh, very first year in service, 2004. Um, when I started lecturing in her planetarium, and I have never, ever, ever, ever let go. I have my teeth sunk in, and they'll pry that ship off of me with you know, my cold, dead hands. <laughs> I am not leaving. So that's how I got involved. It was really yeah. a lot of dumb luck. Um, but I, I do know a lot of people, actually, who have sailed on the ship as passengers, uh, or who want to, yeah. or whatever else they're going to. So... She's, she's got a following, including a few movie stars, at least one or two of which I've seen, at least in passing. Yeah. Yeah. Rod Stewart. Uh, well, you know, you do what you can. I mean, <laughs> Rod Stewart. But actually, you know who I'd like to bump th bent into is uh, Richard Dreyfus. Richard Dreyfus is one of these guys who only travels ocean liners, wow. if, he can, if he can do it. Um, and I met some uh, lady... Uh, up on deck, I'll have to do, like, stargazing for the passengers. Yeah. And there was this chick... I say this chick, um, Madam Chick. Uh, she was wearing a fox fur from her neck down to her ankles, and she was a Russian uh, heiress who was involved with like the oil trade and something like that. Yeah. And you know, people like that, I I don't generally hang with. Yeah. Uh, but that that's the world of the ocean liner. That's a little different. I will tell you something actually about about engines now. Um, one of the things that I love is, because I've already said about the commonality between these the ocean liners and the battleships, um, uh, my first trip on board, I thought, someday I'm going to bring a telescope on this ship. But I didn't know how stable she was. So I wanted to know if she was going to move around too much to look through a telescope. So I brought a green laser with me. And I duct taped it to a bulkhead. I duct taped over the button, I pointed straight up at the stars, at night, on deck, and I duct taped this green laser, wouldn't you see the beam with the green laser, right? So as the ship was rolling at high speed, I could actually track how much she was moving against the stars, right. and I could get a number from that. So here I am out doing this, and an officer spots me up on the deck, and it turns out it's the chief engineer. And he comes over, striding over to me, asking me what I'm doing. Um, he's a pretty intimidating guy. He's like three foot five. He's like hobbit tall. Little guy, <laughs> but wide. He's built built well, like a battleship. Uh, he's got say, uh, uh, hoochie coochie girls tattooed all up and down his arms. 
and uh, he's from Scotland. His name was uh, Ronnie Keel, and he came over to me and asked me what I was doing, and I explained it to him. I said, you know, it's kind of like trying to do stargazing from the back of a of a galloping horse, and he took violent exception to that. He said, it is new it! And I was like, oh God, oh God, I've upset this guy. And he came over and he put his arm around me and he leaned in and he said, it's like trying to do stargazing from the back of a quarter of a million horses. <laughs> and I was like, oh dude, I totally get it. This is, <laughs> this is your car. Okay, and he, he, he doesn't... The, the, it, the sovereign nation the, of engineering. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> and so the quarter million horsepower was his thing. And that's something this ship, ship has too. Um, so the, their, that, that beefy heart and the ability to power through um, is something that I, I respect. I like that. I worked, well, if I didn't mention it earlier, I worked on the space shuttle program uh, for a couple of years. My dad worked on the Apollo program. So high-powered machinery is something I like. Um, my, my favorite part of... Um, the movie Empire of the Sun, you remember the P-51 buzzes the, the, the kid who's interested in airplanes. But the thing he yells that I like, apart from saying Cadillac of the Sky, he yells out, HORSEPOWER! And I'm like, I totally get that. <laughs> I'm a horsepower guy. I see in the game we're playing, uh, which, which, which of the girls are we playing? Missouri. Oh, playing Missouri. Okay. Yeah. Who, who are we destroying? Uh, this one right now, uh, Missouri. <laughs> oh, another Missouri. <laughs> I, it, it's a sibling rivalry. You know? Yeah, I, I was I was mentioning this earlier. I mean, as a maritime historian guy, this that just strips the gears in my head. I I could only do this. I mean, I would hold my fire if I saw. <laughs> I said, "Well, God, that's the Indianapolis. I can't shoot the Indianapolis. It's nuts." <laughs> It's uh, oh God! I'm at, uh, if he was in a tier six game in the Arizona, I know, I know. No, I, we were actually talking about this. There's a lot of great stuff in this game. It's just I want a button in the corner where you <laughs> can say reasonably historically accurate and push that. These matches are fun, but I can't do it. I couldn't fire on the Arizona for God's <laughs> sakes. That's well, you know, history guys. Yeah. <clears throat> It does have the Belfast too, which is yes. a, a very annoying little ship. Oh, actually, and it's kind of fun for HMS Belfast. I should say that um, I had a chance to visit HMS Belfast in the Pool of London, as they call it, on the Thames River. Um, and I was wearing, you know, my Iowa cap, and it was kind of fun when I went across because they're very proud of their ship. She's well maintained. She's a good museum. All the rest flat. But, you know, I mean, they, they, they kind of are puffed up when you come across the gangway at first. And then they saw my hat. And they kind of sagged a little bit. It's kind of like, <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> it's like, well, no, no, no. I mean, this isn't, this is a really cute little cruiser. I like your little ship, you know? <laughs> um, look at those little barbettes. I mean, they're adorable. <laughs> You know, we played that up a little bit, had some fun with it, but they were excited. Uh, they threw you in the brig, didn't they? Uh, yes, actually, there are pictures of me in the brig. <laughs> no joke, no joke, seriously, I ended up in the brig. Um, but actually, going back to a historical connection with uh, Iowa herself and, and Britain, um, the naval station at Portsmouth, which is so important, is a place that the Iowa has visited. And it turns out... Uh, I have met a number of British people who remember Iowa's visit to Portsmouth. Wow. It was a big deal to them. Um, I met a lady, actually she was a passenger on QM2, and she came over and said, oh, oh, Iowa, I remember her. She saw the baseball cap. And she actually lived in a different part of England. She didn't live in Portsmouth, but she and her family took a train to go across and see Iowa when she visited. Hmm. And uh, Iowa's crews la lined the rail, they, they did proper honor for uh, the flagship of the British fleet, which I'm sure you know is HMS Victory. So you've got the 1770 ship of the line Victory sitting over there, mm. and our crew manning the rail for her. And uh, they had a, a crew exchange. Some of Victory's crew went aboard Iowa, some of Iowa's crew went aboard Victory. 
And uh, just the last time, this was two years ago when I visited Portsmouth myself, again, I had the cap. But unlike the fun I was having with the Belfast gang, where we were kind of mutual teasing back and forth, the, the people at Victory uh, stood upright and were excited to see somebody. <laughs> the first thing they thought is, um, have you visited the Iowa in California? I said, no, actually, I work there. And then they asked if I had served on board, and I said, no, I actually didn't. And uh, the fellow who greeted me on the Victory said, it's all right. I didn't serve in the Navy on the Victory either. I'm like, well, (laughs) no, I'm thinking you probably didn't. So he said, no, 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 it's exactly the same. We both appreciate what we've got, and we're taking care of her. But uh, my big moment, they, they took real interest in me. They toured me around. They gave me a personal tour of the ship. But they brought me down to the gun deck to one of the guns, the actual guns that fought at Trafalgar. And they, they actually ran me through the evolution of the gun, where I uh, putting the projectile down, doing the sponging, ramming the projectile, uh, the firing cord and all the rest of this. Mm-hmm. And they let me pull the trigger line on one of the guns that fired at Trafalgar. And then they said, all right, that was all fun, but here's the deal. The reason we did this is so that when we come to California, <laughs> we get to pull the trigger on yours. And I'm like, all right, I mean, you know, look me up. We'll see if we can arrange something. <laughs> I didn't know while you were buttering me yeah. up this whole time that that was your trick. Uh, but but they said, no, the, the ships are in the same family, yeah. really. Yeah. They're an evolution of one to the other. Well, I'm sure that we can find a way to get them to main battery plot. Uh, I'm, I'm sure we could, actually. Yeah. Uh, what a kick it would be to have some of Victory's crew here yeah. and and show them that. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that would be a lot of fun. So I, if you're out there listening and you're some of HMS Victory's people, I hope you, you do come out here and uh, see what uh, our version of a warship is like. <laughs> Not teasing in the slightest. No, 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 no. No, uh, <laughs> no and, and the same for, for Belfast and a lot of other... Naval museums. We we can't help our size. I mean, we, <laughs> we can't help it. I mean, you know, God. Um, actually, the the I was I was mentioning to Danny earlier the the fellow who does lots of the reviews of this uh, Rear Admiral Jingles. Mm-hmm. Um, I I actually because he's based in the UK. When I was over there, I sent him a note in case he was free for a pint, um, and. Uh, I sent him a photograph of me standing on the forecastle of the ship. It said, "This is my tier nine. Uh, I don't play the game. I do watch yeah. the game because there's less risk to my reputation. <laughs> I, I'm sure I would last like five seconds. This game is so much faster. Yeah. I, I don't know to what extent it's accelerated in time, but uh, I, I'd be spending all my time strategizing. Yeah, yeah, you know." I'd spend an hour sneaking up on the Ibuki, um, during which time the game would have ended, generations <laughs> would have passed, all the rest of this. Oh, and all right, now, Danny, yeah. your your camouflage is responsible. I like that. <laughs> there are people whose ships are color oh, yeah. ships should not be. Yes. Yeah. All right? I mean, I'm just... Yeah. As a maritime artist... How long have I worked to get the colors right? And I see this guy going, neon pink? Yeah. I like it. And again, the gears <laughs> strip in my head. And I say, well, well, then why are you playing this? Because the idea here is something that's that's going to look realistic to me. But Well, to, um, to be fair, the um, if they wanted a neon pink military vehicle, they could always do tanks and be in the desert. Well, it's true. It's <laughs> true. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, as long as you're as long as you're camouflaged in your environment, I, I, and the, you know the painted desert, you could have a painted tank. Uh, to be fair, to an extent, especially um, because the camo that uh, Danny are, is uh, running on the, um, or I got this comment. Just be glad they don't have Nevada's final paint job. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but the trick would be you just you just have the player for the Nevada. And the bomb dropping. You just see if you can throw Nevada through the air. And then you have um, someone on Nevada's deck shouting, Yes! Yeah, 
<laughs> yeah, and you got of course so you know. and then do, do you want to play time the number two? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> Yeah, I, obviously there may be some folks there out, out watching who don't know that the uh, Battleship Nevada, Survivor, of Pearl Harbor, all the rest of that, was sunken in, well, heavily damaged during nuclear bomb tests after the war and painted shocking orange to make her an easier target against the, the Blue Ocean. But I, I that's totally undignified. It was a terrible end for the Nevada. I mean, well, no, but seriously, the, the Nevada could have been here. I mean, it could have. yeah. I mean, the Nevada could have been here. The California could have been here. Yeah. Uh, my personal favorite. I wish we had California, because my great uncle served on it. Um, so I've got some family naval history, but uh, I would have been happy to uh, to see those ships survive. Yeah. And it, with some of them, they tried, and they failed. That's the sad thing in history is there have been a whole slew of important ships, naval and otherwise, where people realized what they had. And they launched a campaign and tried to savor the old carrier Enterprise, not the nuclear one, the one before that, World War II carrier. They tried, it failed, and they ended up going to the scrapyard. So it's not just like nobody has a clue. They try and it doesn't work. Um, and, of course, saving all of the Iowas uh, was, was not easy either. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, oh, gosh, I didn't mention this. You, I don't even know if any of you guys know this. Um, there's a fellow on board... Uh, the ship named David Way, who's, uh, you know, our historian. Mm -hmm. um, I worked with Dave Way uh, back on the space shuttle program. He was like two cubicles now. And he actually was involved in one of the very earliest attempts to save some of the Iowa class, way before this is... 9th, 1989. It's that far back. They're still in commission. They're starting to think about what's going to happen when they retire them. And the city of San Diego was starting to get a hankering for a naval museum. And what they, the proposal that was being put together, I don't even remember the name of the organization anymore, was to get to New Jersey in particular and get her into San Diego. And so Dave was involved with them. He pulled me into this group of people. And it was one of my early art jobs was to do renderings of the San Diego Convention Center and the pier and the New Jersey at the pier and how that would work. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the, it was just a daydream, but in the back of everybody's minds was, and, and Dave and I talked about it in the day, that uh, it'd, be a, it'd be a shame if these ships got scrapped. And we're all thinking about that potential future where we lose them. We're thinking the only one they're gonna save is Missouri. That was in the back of our mind because of course the end of the war on our deck, right? Um, but they all ended up getting saved. I just think that's wonderful. You know, uh, Marty told us how um, New Jersey and Iowa were swapped mm -hmm. um, you know, in the mid '90s, so that New Jersey could be tied up um, across from Philly, yeah, in Camden. Sure, but um, yeah, big or uh, Iowa got really close. Yeah. Oh, I know. I know. It, it's kind of amazing um, how close she came uh, to not making it. And uh, now she's not only made it, she's made it big time. She's surviving very well. And she's, in some ways, I mean, the Missouri is maybe in the first best place of the Iowas because she's at Pearl. Uh, but the Iowas in such a great place being in L.A. that I think her future is very secure. Um, I like thinking about... Um, the ship being here two, three hundred years from now, uh, where all of us will be historical characters who are involved <laughs> with her now, you know, wearing these these twenty first century costumes, and, you know, we, it's it's kind of funny because you never think of yourself being in the past, yeah. But it's a yeah. great way to interpret the present that we are actually of a generation where we've talked to World War Two veterans, yeah. yeah. And that doesn't seem weird to us. It doesn't seem weird to any of the people listening. Go, well, sure, yeah, yeah, I know somebody down the street who was in the war. Uh, but my dad, when I was a kid, told me stories when he was growing up in Missouri. A couple doors down was Colonel Tipton, who fought at Gettysburg. Wow. He wow. knew him. <laughs> and so now, even just a generation or two down the line, that sounds freaky to me. So for all of us now, uh, with the history work we're doing, 
we're interfacing with the people who actually served aboard the ship. And that's actually this kind of this blessing that we've got, which you go two generations farther down, there will be no one alive who could ever have served on the ship. They will all be gone and will be gone too. So uh, it places a burden on all of us to get it right. It's kind of funny, you know, you got to write stuff down, you know, the memories and stuff like that when we have people who visit. Um, yeah. Yeah. Of course, they, they announce over the, uh, uh, the loudspeakers, the 1MC, uh, when we have veterans aboard, and one day they announced uh, somebody from the Indianapolis was visiting us. Wow. I know. <laughs> the, every, everybody standing around just kind of, oh, God, yeah. I, I wonder if he was there, you yeah. know, that day. Yeah. And he was there that day. One of the very few survivors. So we still get those people. Yeah. Um, for the 75th, we had someone who served on Iowa here. Yeah. Fortunately, we weren't able to get him here because he ended up taking a tour of the ship, and right. that took up like he, two hours, he three got, hours. Uh, swiped by um, Gallman, uh, <laughs> and uh, was gone. Yeah, and then we had uh, another one of our, I guess, volunteers, uh, Lloyd, mm-hmm. I think, mm-hmm. who served on sure. Carolina, yeah. North yeah, Carolina. So I was just like, ah, oh, we need to get him someday. You know, it was kind of fun. I remember um, we would have people visiting in the old days when I was uh, associated more with the Queen Mary. You'd have people come through, and sometimes you would narrowly miss getting a story. And I remember one of them, and this is a battleship story. There was a British guy who'd been a uh, crew member on the Queen Mary. That's why we're showing him around. We're walking around with the guy. And at the end of the tour, we're going across the gangway, and then he remembers, oh yeah, yeah, that day when we sank the Bismarck. I was like, whoa, 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 <laughs> yes. whoa. Let's, time out. Yeah, time, time out. out. <laughs> Separate conversation. Let's talk about this. He was on the Dorsetshire. Huh. And so he not only was present at the sinking of the Bismarck, he watched her sink. He saw it. He wow. was on deck. And that made this man the only person I'd ever met who'd seen it in color. And, and, well, hey, as an artist, though, I got a job to do. Yeah. And in fact, um, uh, on board the ship, in fact, right now, I've got a painting that I'm working on of the sinking of the Bismarck based on my conversation with him. Wow. He said the thing that nobody understood were the colors of what it actually looked like. I was the first guy to ask. He said yeah. it was kind of a gray, chilly day. Um, but they, they sank the ship later in the day. The sun was starting to go down. And he said that the uh, mass of smoke from the Bismarck had risen up to a great height. And it was all oranges and browns. And he said the moment of the sinking, the sun went behind those and turned blood red. And that was what was shining down on the Bismarck at the moment of her death. And that's Speaking a good example. Where, uh, I don't think he ever <laughs> told, told yeah. anybody... But I'm doing a painting of, of Bismarck going ahead, awesome. rolling over, with the cordite smoke and the red sunlight coming down on her. And, you know, I, I'm sure he's no longer with us. That was a number of years ago. Yeah. And so those kinds of stories just disappear. And that, that's a shame. They actually do have the uh, Bismarck and Hood both in game. By the oh, way. oh yes. Yeah, I've seen them in this game sailing in formation together, <laughs> which, again, is just awkward, and I I do not dig on that, but, <laughs> I mean, I just, I'm waiting for the turrets to go sideways. So, I'm guessing you do not ship Hood and Bismarck? No, no. Um, <laughs> like I say, I, I'm just trapped in history here. For me, this is all kind of wish fulfillment stuff, yeah. and so, for me, I'd like it if they, they're just setting up a historical situation on a map of a real location where I know where everything is uh, that's the way I'd want to play but again I'm I'm way off on one end of the bell curve I know they're I'm not their main customer one guy says you want awkward I fly the hood memorial flag from my Bismarck <laughs> oh oh whoa. war trophy or for that matter yeah. flying the uh, Arizona memorial flag from Kaga <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh! Well, of course, we do have a war trophy flag on board this ship, and do we not? Um, we do indeed. Yeah, so we've got an IGN flag 
uh, in one of the historical um, displays? From Congo. Nagato. It's, it's Nagato. It's Nagato. Yes, of course. Uh, because our Marines were actually some of the first to board her yeah. uh, when she surrendered to right. the U.S. And so we got the um, the first chance at looting, or excuse me, acquiring looting. <laughs> well, actually, really, you can't feel too badly about it because our the flag, the IJN flag that we've got, is on display and is safe. It's true. It's not in somebody's garage. It is. So, so it was for well, a long time, but now. yeah, <laughs> but, but now, but now it found its way to a good place. So I, I think they'd be happy about that. My um, my wife's uh, grandfather. Uh, fought on Iwo Jima and he came home with uh, three samurai swords. Mm -hmm. And uh, shortly after his funeral, we were contacted by some very wonderful gentlemen uh, from the Japanese consulate mm -hmm. because it's like most original samurai swords, like the ancient ones, are right. here in the United States. Yeah. Because they were taken home as souvenirs. And so they wanted to take a look at them. Of course. <laughs> yeah, I get the idea. I, I have a Japanese officer sword. My uncle was a Marine, and he brought one back. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I've had the, the same thought that after a certain period of time, these things have to go to certainly a safe place where they can be appreciated. I'd be happy to repatriate uh, the sword if I could just find out where it should go. That's the tough part. This guy says he flies the 75th. Pearl Harbor flag from Nagato. <laughs> this is actually the flagship of the operation. So, of course, of course. All right. Yeah. Do we want to use something else? You like to see something else being played? Oh wow! Um, other than the Iowa, because we other just than usually... other than the Iowa. Oh uh, gosh. Get... Oh, I don't know the Porter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, uh, Porter versus Iowa. <laughs> I mean, uh, Let's have some fun. Yeah, Launch uh, I, spread a torpedo. We don't. I mean, we can... We, can no, I'm we, we have the Fletcher, but... Well. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it is the class. We, we did talk about that last... It was the last week. Yeah, yeah it, it was during the 75th stream. How, like, any... Um, it would be we, a nice Easter egg. <laughs> yeah. We, we joked that if a um, Fletcher class accidentally hit a friendly ship with a torpedo, it should act automatically be renamed William D. Porter. Yeah, oh yeah, so we'll get the little <laughs> Porter Award, you know, the <laughs> friendly fire accident there. Yeah, um, yeah actually, the, the Fletchers are, are kind of fun. I, um, I've done a number of commissions for naval veterans, and those are always interesting because you get all the stories behind them. Yeah. And uh, one of them was for a Fletcher-type uh, guy. Uh, it was a USS Waller a DD-466, if I remember correctly. Um, and he was uh, going to be torpedoed. And this was his whole story. Um, it was when the uh, Chicago was sunk, actually. And the cruiser. And the thing that had happened was they were pickets. All these ships were forming a picket line on the sides of the cruiser line. It was the Vincennes, Chicago. I forget, I think it's 1942, I forget the exact date, but so they're escorting them, and the Japanese came out and attacked with uh, uh, torpedo planes, and they launched a whole line of torpedoes, but they came straight at the destroyers, they were aiming at the destroyers, and so all the guys on uh, the Waller were watching this happen, and the torpedoes ran right underneath their keels. They were they nailed them. Right, exactly. You got that moment, and this guy's telling the story to me about everybody cheering, and then they went under their keel and nailed the Chicago. Uh, so there's, yeah. yeah, there's this moment right where everybody's been yes, doing this. Yes, yes. No, no. Sorry, you know, and they'd failed to. Uh, they shot down the planes, but they failed to save the Chicago. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, that was the thing he asked me to paint for his daughter. So I had to do all the research into the lighting, you know, everything about that moment to show the torpedo track going under. And uh, I recreated his exact figure, what he was wearing, where he was standing on deck, watching the torpedo go under. Um, he said he was actually shooting at it with a rifle uh, oh, wow. from the deck. Uh, there were people who were trying to do that pathetically. Yeah. Um, yeah. But... Yeah, when, when you get a chance to try to recreate a moment like that, it's always strange because, you know, you're like the last person who's going to get to help tell that story. Yeah. And he passed away like six months later. 
So all of his other stories, just gone. Everything he didn't think to tell his daughter. And the weird thing was, when, when he was talking to me, um, he actually, his, his daughter was in the room, she was looking, going, really? You, you, she hadn't heard most of the stories. He waited to find yeah. somebody to tell. Wow. Um, in particular, um, you, we had a conversation that was so interesting. Um, she was, t uh, she heard stories. She brought it up. She said, "Dad, tell him about uh, about the time you guys all shot coconuts in the water." Right. <laughs> yeah. And and he was he was describing it kind of to her at first, and they said, "Really, they weren't coconuts." And mm. yeah, they weren't. And he said the problem was they had actually had um, uh, Japanese survivors floating in the water who came aboard with grenades and things oh. like that on ships. They'd been given orders to shoot the guys in the water and to not take them out. And so it bothered him so much that he remembered this, but he'd changed the story for her. So he'd kind of told her what they had to do, but didn't want to. Right. And he broke down when he was there with me in the room and for the first time told her what had happened. Wow. And he was really haunted by it. Um, and it was kind of kind of a startling moment. I don't, I don't know why he. I guess he realized he might not have much time left, and he, he had to finally say just how bad the war had been for him. Yeah. So that was that was a tough one. Uh, but fortunately, uh, the the painting was of his moment, getting to see a torpedo up close. Um, I'm glad he he didn't ask me to paint something more difficult. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I tell. The story that, um, or during the overnights, I tell the story of a guy who was on Franklin. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And he actually, and this was another one where he had never told his family, and sure. from the looks on their faces, this was the first time they were hearing it. He had opened a hatch um, during the attack. He was like, yeah. traveling through the ship and yeah. opened a hatch when the place he was about to go into uh, turned into a fireball and he and just leaned to, back had to close the hatch and, slant, and yep. slammed it down yeah sure I mean, yeah all, all these experiences it, it's easy to well to transform them into something like what we have here a video game and all that the real experience of course is different yeah and the veterans that we talk to um, certainly make it clear but it, it's not like just game over. Yeah. Uh, that yeah. it's an easy thing to dismiss. Yeah, it's a. Uh, there was another uh, thing. Actually, kind of. It, it does kind of involve this ship. Uh, because uh, the typhoon that damaged this ship. Yeah. Right? Um, uh, I was actually asked to do a, a painting for a guy who was on another ship at the, in the same storm. Uh, it was in an LST of all things. Wow. Yeah, I mean, you know, it was bad enough that it damaged a battleship, and of course it capsized three destroyers, yeah, three. lost with almost all hands. Uh, this poor guy was on one of these little crate like uh, LST ships and uh, riding these 70 foot waves up and down over the top. And he uh, collared me at some kind of an event and asked me to paint it because I was a science guy and he said I, I want my wife to know what it was like and so that, that painting Joe versus the typhoon was the title yeah. was of him strapped to the top of the superstructure of this thing writing it over uh, and he said that, that he'd been in combat a whole bunch of times uh, he was at Okinawa all kinds of places he said he was never scared but during the typhoon he was terrified yeah because it was so impersonal when the sea was trying to kill you. Yeah. He said, God, don't let me die like this. I mean, it, it, the enemy, it's for something, it's for a cause, but we all forget just how dangerous the ocean itself really is. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a brave thing to get into any ship. Yeesh. Yeah. I have a comment. The ship's... Um, in the Chicago story you're telling, uh, Quincy, Astoria, and Vincennes. Absolutely. Thank you for the reminder. Um, of course, I had to, to go through the action reports from the different ships. 
Mm -hmm. uh, I was very concerned about the lighting at that moment in particular. I had to have their exact compass bearings because being uh, an astronomer, I actually set up the whole scene in 3D mm -hmm. with the weather report. I painted a cycloramic painting of the clouds. Um, I actually, in the painting, the planet Venus is represented exactly where it was over Chicago at that moment at, uh, I believe, sunset. <laughs> what? No, I'm just I, saying, wow, that's I, like... I can't stop myself. <laughs> Astronomy is not yeah. a hobby. It's a Guys, disease, Guys, I, yeah, I just man. want the ship and the torpedo, yeah, and I want myself I in there. No, let's no. put Venus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was uh, there, man. All of a sudden, this explains a lot more of... Um, the James Cameron and the Titanic movie and having to get the stars exactly right. Well, I, I gotta tell you something about that, because, I mean, you know, <laughs> I like the Titanic movie. The scene with the drawing, especially. But the thing that did not work for me was that the first times I saw the Titanic movie, the stars were not correct. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I, I'm like, oh. Wasn't there a lot of stuff that happened online because of that? Like, yeah. a lot of people noticed it. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. Now, here's the fun thing. There's a, there's a very famous artist, a guy named Ken Marshall, who does ocean liner art. Uh, a lot of the Titanic artwork you've seen is Ken Marshall, the best Titanic art. Um, he's world class. And um, I met him. I asked him about that. It turns out he was the art uh, consultant for Titanic. It's kind of... A, some scenes are even based on his paintings. Well, he wanted the stars to be accurate. Mm -hmm. He brought it up with them during production, and they said, oh, no one's ever going to care. <laughs> and they, they went ahead and made the film the way they made it, but afterward, people did notice, yeah. and they went back in, and they fixed it. And it can, it can be important. It can totally be mm -hmm. important. I can name at least one naval vessel that was sunk by astronomy which is the Indianapolis mm. because the bearing of the moment at which she emerged into the site of the I-58 I believe it was mm -hmm. uh, Japanese submarine was when the gibbous moon rose behind her hmm. by stupid luck the clouds cleared at that moment and she was silhouetted against the moon there was absolutely no way to miss her so the moon killed the Indianapolis huh. um, so the, the stars are always involved um, in in a lot, at least in a lot of the stories, if you've got clear weather, people remember these things. Yeah. I still want to do a painting of some battleship. I don't. I almost don't even care which one. Uh, lit entirely by phosphorescence, uh, because the phosphorescent wakes in the South Pacific could be incredibly strong when you drive through the water at high speed. You get the green glow off the waves, and I'd like to do uh, one of those ships in silhouette seen against like the Milky Way where she's revealed as an emptiness in the stars mm -hmm. and but you can see her wake glowing around her it's wow. such a surreal scene I've heard people talk about this stuff but because film is too slow you can't capture it on film hmm. which makes it my world at that point if you can't take a picture of it that's my job um, so I'd, I'd like to show that <laughs> They have one comment that that's what sets them off about the Pearl Harbor movie. They got triggered because of all the stuff in there that is obviously not belonging to 1941. The, the comment yeah. immediately after is, we do not speak of that movie. Which I think <laughs> Yeah, I, I was going to say, that's the thing that set you off about Pearl? That's the thing? <laughs> hey, great. What's going on? Oh, not much. How about you? Hanging in there. Yeah. I want to step in front of the camera real quick so people no. can actually... <laughs> Okay. Not today. <laughs> then another day. Yeah. Yeah, what are you doing another day? I just I just came up to see what you guys are doing. Um, so, oh. just uh, uh, talking about ships and paintings, paintings and painting of, of ships. Yeah, they're they're prying every every story out of me. So <laughs> we're we're getting to most of these. Uh, well, I'll tell you one. There's a painting that I've been working on. Um, as well, again, it's astronomy and things like that. Um, it's actually the day after Pearl Harbor. The, it's specifically the night after the mm -hmm. attack. Um, I went to the trouble of recreating the stars the way they looked that night. Turns out it was a clear night. It was a beautiful tropical night. And the, the source of light in the painting is entirely the Arizona burning. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So the column of flame there with this Viking kind of funeral pyre there with the correct constellations over it and all that. I know. I mean, you know, some, somebody cares. I care, right? <laughs> I care. Uh, but the, the reason I remember this is because I, I met somebody who was able to read a newspaper that night by the light of that fire. Oh, wow. Sitting there on one of the decks of the ship just watching this. Once everything else was burned out, they said the two things you'd see were the, this incredible fire just going and going and going and going, uh, and the, the black uh, uh, smoke rising up in the sky, blocking out the stars, and the other thing were little tiny sparks of light uh, on the Oklahoma, the up, upturned Oklahoma, on the West Virginia. You'd see little hand lanterns flickering in and out as people were crawling around, and they watched that all night. Uh, this really strange, surreal show, uh, of which you can go ahead and look. There are no photographs, and the reason, again, for that is the slowness of film. Right. You couldn't shoot this scene, but people really remembered it. I was asking if there's a link to that painting anywhere. Uh, not yet. Uh, it's not yet finished. Uh, it's actually sitting a couple hundred feet behind me. Um, but I, I'd love to, uh, to come back on uh, sometime and show you some yeah. of the artwork stuff because we talked a little bit about, you know, like the sinking of the Bismarck. Yeah. Uh, that that's one that I'm anxious to share because it was so incredible. Um, there's there's another one which is a story the the never heard of it. In fact, another person has joined us here who's a former Queen Mary person. This may be a surprise even to you. I don't know. Um, I, I'll be curious to see if this is a story you've heard. Not about the Mary, but about the Queen Elizabeth. Uh, she was sailing in 1942 between uh, Seattle and, I believe, Fremantle in Australia. Uh, she had an escort of a couple of old U.S. destroyers. Uh, everybody famously knows the Queen Mary cut a light cruiser, HMS Curacao, in two uh, during an accident uh, when the ships are zigzagging and Curacao caught, caught a across the bow of the Mary and got caught. But before that happened, a year before that happened, um, the uh, USS Alden, which was an old four-stack destroyer from World War II, World War One, mm -hmm. uh, was escorting her at night. And uh, they said they could only see the Queen Elizabeth based on a big, dark shadow in the stars. Um, so she was this big, black emptiness um, and when I worked out their courses, by the way, I will tell you, I sorted out why they could see her at all, was the Milky Way was rising right on that compass bearing. So it's constellations of Sagittarius and Scorpius, for those back home, go to, well, of course. Um, <laughs> so it just very, very luckily happens to be the brightest part of the Milky Way. So you've just got this gigantic black shape going back and forth across the Milky oh, Way behind cool. you. Wow. And the Alden was watching this, uh, of course, all the ships have all their lights out. Uh, but then, this ship is so old that she has a tiller that has rope, I mean hawsers, involved with the steering mechanism. And she's a World War One ship. Yeah. And the damn rope broke. Bam! She lost her steering. And she started going right in front of the Elizabeth's nose, and the Elizabeth's nose started blocking out more and more and more of the stars. And at a last minute, panic, the captain of the Alden said, turn on every light you've got. They flashed all of their lights on, never mind the danger. The Elizabeth put her helm all the way over and slid past 20 feet from the stern of the Alden. Wow. wow. No, so, I had never heard that story. Yeah, exactly. That it happened before the later time that yeah. we all know of. Right. And so for me, uh, painting the Elizabeth's nose coming up out of the stars into the light and it would have been, you know, six stories in the air. Um, that That's a great scene. A scene. So anyway, I've got a painting of that that I'm working on yeah, <laughs> as well. Um, and I also did some paintings of the accident with Curacao, um, which again was informed by people who had visited the Queen Mary who were there that day. And uh, it's kind of funny. Artists will try... I mean, this goes back, you know, like William Shakespeare. Why was Richard III a bad guy? Well, I'll ask who, you know he was working for, uh, you know what to paint to make things look a little more palatable. And all of the illustrations of this accident show the warship being hit by the ocean liner in fog, haze, it's like, oh, they're, oh no. I talked to a, a soldier yeah. who was on deck. Yeah. 
you could see for miles. It was yeah. a beautiful day. And so I did a couple of paintings of the Curacao accident based on that idea. And also um, how Curacao got hit. He was the first person that could tell me what it, what the dynamics were. And as a science guy, I, I really wanted to get that right. Um, because it wasn't one of these just catcher in the middle kind of things. The Curacao almost beat the crossing gate. She was at a, a strong angle to the Mary's nose. She was caught about maybe like 15 feet from the stern mm -hmm. at, at an angle while she was trying to get across. And the Mary's nose pushed up the side of the ship until it got midships, swung her sideways, then rolled her over and pushed to the middle. And the guy, he, he was on the starboard side of the Queen Mary, and he said they watched it as it happened, as it was the unfolding of the scene that was so rough. Once they caught her stern, it was like this thing you couldn't look away from as it just got worse and worse. Um, but, but that's an example of where nobody's shooting cameras there are only one or two pictures of the accident you know hastily snapped after um and it, it, in fact this is another naval painting that i want to do i haven't done no one has ever mentioned what he said happened once the ship was split in two and sliding down the sides the 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 uh soldiers the americans on deck uh of course were in tremendous danger of being torpedoed or whatever else themselves they took off their own life jackets and were throwing them over the sides. And he said it was raining life jackets down the side of the Queen Mary onto the Curacao as these guys took off the only protection they had and threw it to the poor guys down below. That's, uh, a, that's, a, that's a visual right there. It is. It I, I was, when he was talking about it, I was yeah. thinking, someone needs to see that yeah. moment. Um, yeah. as, as an artist, I want to do that. As a maritime historian, I want to do that so someone will know. Yeah. Um, there was a, Actually, this is kind of funny because I'm accused of being a romantic artist. <laughs> and, you know, what would be nice and what would be poetic. And I know how artists get... I had a, um, a painting I did of a Spitfire buzzing the Queen Mary. I love Spitfires, okay? I mean, I was just like, <laughs> the, I mean, this needs to have happened. And I painted this thing where I've got a spit coming down uh, lower than, than the boat deck, right down on the water, alongside the Queen Mary. The pilot is waving to the soldiers on deck, and everybody is cheering as the spit buzzes the Mary. And I'm thinking, this is like the World War II moment I wish happened. And I felt dirty all over doing this painting. Because I know I, I am totally yanking everybody's chain you know, oh what a moment but you know I'm making it up and I'm feeling bad about this. Five, six years later I'm reading the book uh, which was The Queens at War if I remember the name correctly I remember the book okay. yeah, they, remember. there's a passage yeah. in there where a sergeant who is of Italian American descent from New York is in count. He said it was really, really lonely out there at sea. They were very nervous on the Queen Mary because they were so defenseless. But uh, right before they got into British coastal waters, three Spitfires of the RAF Coastal Command came in and came from the stern, buzzed the ship below the height of the boat deck. And all the soldiers on board cheered as the pilot waved to them. Ah, <laughs> I, was, uh, <gasps> I was reading this, just like set the book down. What just happened there? <laughs> you know, it's so I apparently painted it without knowing. <laughs> um, that was just really creepy. Originally, there was only one spit in my painting, but I put the other two flying back behind the funnels after that, just so it is that moment. But. Yeah, everybody's always doing all these weird Queen Mary stories. That stuff's weirder than any of the rest of that. Yeah. Um, but that, that, that's another one of those uh, maritime right. history paintings that uh, uh, still freaks me out. We'll definitely have to uh, get some images of that and put them up next time. Yeah, that would actually be a lot of fun. Yeah. 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 Or at least on the, um, the Facebook page. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Wait, somewhere. We, yeah, we can get some images. Um, I had fun with a buddy of mine. Um, it, it shows a U-boat uh, with the torpedoed ship rolling over and going down in the background, but it's Queen Mary that's sinking. 
that is that is so much fun to show people, especially maritime historians, because it takes them a while uh, to realize. <laughs> Artists don't have to play by those same rules. <laughs> of, it really happened, you know. It's just has to look cool. <laughs> <laughs> I will say that's the most people I ever painted in one painting. Uh, I did more than 3,000 individual figures on the deck, yes. each with their own damn life jacket. Oh. Yeah. So, oh. I, yeah, I know. Just individually. And you know, the worst thing about it was that as you paint them, every one of them gets a story. <laughs> I, I see the six inch duck deck, the deck gun crew aft. I know what they're doing. I, I see guys trying to push the Carly floats up off the starboard boat deck to get them over the side. And these people become real to me. And then it starts settling on you how dangerous something like a war really is. And then the back of my mind, I start looking at all the portholes and the windows. And I know how many people are in the hallways and aren't going to make it to the deck. Uh, as she goes over, and um, that, that that kind of stuff, it, that that's really in a way what what historical artwork is for. In a way, is to communicate an idea. They're not just like portrait artwork. Right. I get asked every once in a while to do maritime portrait stuff, which is, you know, the equivalent of you know, paint your uncle Joe with a vase of flowers or whatever else. And people will do. Here's a painting of a ship. Some water, tranquil harbor, a couple seagulls. I'll, I, I'll do that once in a while, but usually at least I will try to illustrate a moment. That's like the next level up for me is a historical moment, do the research, try to show what it would have liked, been like to be there. But then there's this whole other level above that, which would be like the Spitfire buzzing mm -hmm. the Queen Mary. I, I wasn't trying to show you a moment in time. I was trying to show you an idea about the ship, what it represented, uh, what what the feeling of a time or place would be, even if it didn't necessarily happen, but to communicate a historical lesson about what the ship represented. Right. So it's like, you know, portraits is the lowest level, which I'll do. I mean, you know, <laughs> I get asked sometimes. It, it's a living. It's a living, exactly. It's, it's almost like when you want to, you want to do when a, when Mary came in with a full yeah. And pass by the statue. Oh, of course. You know, the, yeah. yeah. And just the, the, the feeling that men at that point in time. Sure, that's that would be an idea piece. It, it could be a, a real moment that happened in history. No, it, it, um, it obviously, obviously do. I mean, we've, yeah. we've both heard the stories of, you know. Sure. And, yeah. and we haven't been call the ship at attention as she's going over the whole and tunnel. Yep. So, so they go to bounce. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, um, I am not the worst sailor in the world. Uh, but I'm not the best either and one of my paintings I want to do to communicate the real idea of it being at sea is a painting of a ship's deck probably the Queen Mary with the horizon at an angle about at 45 degrees with somebody bent over the rail in the background um, and have that one called getting there is half the fun yes yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, the rolling Mary as she was called yep could roll the milk out of a cup of tea that's it um, Fortunately, this ship has a very low center of, of gravity, so battleships, I guess, would tend to be a little bit more stable. Although I've heard a story uh, <coughs> that someone told me that their grandfather told them uh, of during Typhoon Cobra. Yeah. And they were in a uh, destroyer alongside the New Jersey. Yeah. And they said at one moment they were... Like on a wave, and I guess New Jersey was in a trough, oh. and they were 30 feet above the Jersey, and then yep. 10 seconds later, the positions were reversed. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, the, the, the verticality of that is something that people forget and usually don't shoot pictures of. Um, <laughs> but, well, well they, 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 you know, yeah, it, well, yeah, yeah, <laughs> seriously, no, I mean, how terrifying that would be. People forget this. Yeah. And um, I know, for example, um, you may have some books as well by um, uh, Ron Winters. Uh, the, he was an electrician on board the Queen Mary. And uh, he was up in the crow's nest fixing an electric heater. Uh, but she was rolling about 30, 40 degrees to either side at the time. And he said, the thing you're forgetting is that when the ship would go over, the crow's nest wouldn't be over the ship anymore. Right. When you would look down, the waves would be coming up for you. And then you'd roll back, the ship would go the other way, and you'd be held out over the ocean again. 
said that was the terrifying thing. And the same thing with that verticality now. This ship is very low to the water. Mm -hmm. So there's always the possibility you could have somebody on deck when green water comes over you. And that, never mind splash and spray and things mm -hmm. like that, green water scares the hell out of me. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's a terrifying prospect. It, it's visceral. Um, well, go, go back to the, the, the crow's nest again. You, you know, even if you were hitting the head on, and that, and you are mainly vertical, you're looking down, and yeah. you just see the crow's nest going to water. Yep. <laughs> exactly. Don't, don't right. She starts ship. to become a submarine. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There's there's just this this clutching horror yeah, that that settles in on you. Yeah. Um, I just had that happen in person, in a way, which was an interesting test of my courage. Um, okay. I, I was on QM2 a couple trips back, and we got healed over by a hurricane. Um, and we were over about 15 degrees. Well, they have these windows down at the bottom of the ship. She just held over permanently. And there were windows that are only about 15, 20 feet above the waterline. Big square windows you can look out. And we're out there at night. We're held over by this hurricane. And I got the idea, maybe I should go down to those windows. Because I bet they're underwater right now. Wow. And uh, my traveling buddy said, I'll do it. Because I couldn't make myself go. <laughs> and he said he got down to the corridor that led to the windows. And she's groaning and creaking and popping. And she's held over. And he looked into the wall of the room. And he saw the black glass with nothing visible outside. And the glass was sweating. It was uh, wet on the inside from the moisture in the air. Mm -hmm. And he said he could not approach the windows. He couldn't go into the room to answer the question if there were bubbles going up the outside of the window or not. Uh, uh, because it was so frightening to be in the room. Oh, yeah. You yeah. know? You think, dear God, we're underwater. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, being at sea is a really, it's a brave thing to do. It's unnatural. It's dangerous, you know, <laughs> being a space program guy. I get this. The idea that death is right on the outside of the wall next to you, um, th that's one of the reasons why space people like ships, because they're very similar creatures. It's also the reason why most of the astronauts want to be in like, the Sea Lab program. Oh, of course. You know, that's just... Oh, you bet. Um, I have a buddy who is uh, an astronaut candidate right now, and he's uh, right on the edge of acceptance. But his thing, he's a civilian scientist, but his hobby is cave diving. And I, exactly. And it was funny because he's there explaining his hobbies and everything to all of these fighter pilots and everybody else that are evaluating him. He says cave diving, they all just say, okay, you're fine, you're fine. There's nothing we're gonna throw at you that's as bad as that. No. To, to, to just, you're prepared to be in your own zone and it's cool, even though everything around me is really not cool and could kill me in an instant. <laughs> well, e e not my hobby. Even even just skin diving at night. Yes. You, you know, it was just black. You know, all you see is the beam of the light that you have. Yep. You know, <laughs> I, I know that most sharks don't. But if I were to see even a, yeah. you know, a harmless shark at that point in time, uh, sure. it would be a uniform change moment. Yeah, it would be. Uh, I mean, all my life, I've been frightened of the ocean. Which is one reason why I guess I paint it so much. Right? I'm, trying, I'm trying to work. This is not a webcast. This is a therapy session. I want to, I want to, I want to thank you all for, for being here for me today. We really do apologize, folks. Yeah. But, well, I'm sure that you're helping. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> My name is Chris, and I'm hydrophobic. Um, Hi, yeah, Chris. But, <laughs> No, it, it, seriously, I, I, when I went out on a, like a, a sailing expedition kind of thing when I was in second grade, I fell off the boat. Um, and I remember, you know, way, way out, uh, past the breakwater and all this stuff. And I remember as a kid looking down in the water, I actually put my head down, and I looked down past my shoes, and uh, you had the converging rays of light down into the green to a focal point. I could not see the bottom at all, but I could see things down there. Sean said. That there were like little fish swimming around way below me. And it just absolutely, just an adrenaline jolt right in the bottom of you. Just thinking, I can see down a hundred feet underneath me and it's not far enough. So that's what makes a guy, you know, <laughs> an artist, that's, that's what does it to you. <laughs> 
So, anybody wanting to be an artist, just throw yourself off a boat. That's... <laughs> Not assuming the legal responsibility for the suggestion just made. Um, but that was a formative experience. Uh, we lost a viewer before you gave your. Uh, Probably your... because of. <laughs> It, n no, we, uh, they got off before you did your um, qualifier, so... Oh, <laughs> ruh, ruh. <laughs> Well, <laughs> perhaps they were on a cruise, oh, God. <laughs> and they're, they're headed back into the props right now. Um, let's hope not. Uh, we, don't, we don't advocate those yeah. kinds of things, please, of course. Please do not pull a Britannic. Yes, no, none of that. Yeah. No. So, yeah, any other tough questions? Because uh, uh, I got a million of them. So I just who was been... Colonel Warden? Oh, God, oh, Colonel Warden. He wanted the means to actively resist should that become necessary. See, so, yeah, I know who Colonel Warden is. Um, <laughs> all right, take care, Craig. Yeah. Um, the, leaving, leaving all these tough questions for the audience. The uh, Queen Mary's uh, a famous passenger, Colonel Warden, uh, is not Colonel Warden. Uh, it was Gary Oldman just recently, actually. Um, which is, of course, Winston Churchill. Um, so, <laughs> up at the observatory, we had a supervisor who yeah. said that if you wanted to deliver planetarium shows right, you had to speak either like John F. Kennedy or Winston Churchill. That would, those were like your two favorite people. So I would actually <laughs> get up there to annoy him. And I uh, welcome to the Griffith Observatory. My name is Chris Bloodland tonight. We're going to talk about the stars. Uh, or I'd get up there and start talking like Winston Churchill. And so, yeah, that's why I don't present shows at the observatory. Just <laughs> do the art. <laughs> I was actually wondering about that because my wife and I were there the other day and um, we were doing the observatory show and my wife uh, firmly believes that it's recorded ahead of time, but it is not apparently. No, it is not. Um, it's actually, it's scripted. It's written out what you're supposed to say, but they have live presenters at the observatory. That's a tradition that goes back to 1935. Mm -hmm. They've always had a live person. Mm -hmm. uh, but as it's run right now, for quality assurance purposes, they do have a, a formal script, but they do have a live presenter. Okay. So, that's so, how So, Linda, honey, if you are watching this, I'm right. <laughs> and I am so going to pay for that so hard. <laughs> <laughs> well, then, yeah, that's how it's done. Uh, in, in, in the old days, uh, it, it, we had the suggestion of uh, the theater design that we were going to put a stage in the front so you could see the person speaking. And then everyone would know that it was a live person. Mm -hmm. um, but they ended up making the decision to have them come out, introduce themselves in the beginning, and then they retreat to the back of the room behind you. So most people, they, you can't see the person who's speaking, and people assume you just push a button and the spiel comes out. We do not do that. Uh, now, I'm seeing somebody... Somebody, w What's up, man? There's a comment. There's a comment. <laughs> that Nick should sleep on the ship, not the couch. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of the couch for the next few days. <laughs> hey, I, I didn't do it to him. He did it to himself, you know, I mean... <laughs> Don't don't blame me. <laughs> totally uh, blame him. <laughs> <laughs> Darling, I love you. He made me do it. <laughs> <laughs> he told me what to say. You know, I mean, that's not true. It's really it's recording. <laughs> see, um, no, there were people who wanted a recording. Um, uh, in fact, uh, some of the the civic leaders, in fact, uh, wanted to because a lot of planetariums will do that. They'll get a famous person, right? Um, and uh, they all wanted Patrick Stewart. So, you know, welcome to the Girls of the Observatory. It would have been like that. Um, but instead, the show is different every time because it is a live person presenting it. Uh, but they did step on the old situation, which made people nervous sometimes. Each presenter would uh, get to redline their script and kind of make it up as they went. Mm -hmm. In the old days, that's what people used to do. And some people's personalities shone through a little too much. Ah. So th this this way they kind of stick to what we've agreed will be said. Sounds good. Uh, I mean, there was something you were about to say when I burst out laughing. Uh, my you... gosh, I don't remember. This is stream of consciousness. This is right. a therapy <laughs> session. I don't know what's going on. So here we have um, Danny playing a completely fictional ship, yeah. much like ninety percent of the Russian tech tree. I well, really yeah. hate the Russian tech tree. I really do hate the Russian tech tree because <laughs> why? Why? So they wouldn't have anything. 
Well, I, yeah, <laughs> I get that, but the, you know, oh no. And then this game would all be just U.S. and Japanese ships, like it already almost is. Well, <laughs> so Actually, and then, why? Well, I, why do we have a flesh out Russian tech tree, and they're just adding the French battleships now? They uh, don't have the. Could it be there are more Russian gamers? Well, could it's be a that they could it be a demographic a thing. Company. It's a Russian. Well, it, well yeah, that's what I'm saying because yeah. they're based over there. Yeah, it would right. make sense. Their players want to play. And actually, I have no objection to any of that except I'd like them to have the option to just switch over to historical, a, a historical mode, even historical situations. I'm totally good with that. Um, it's it's suited to personality. That's all. I, th I think it's an amazing game. I just. Yeah. If I'm going to play, I have to know the name of the captain of every ship. And <laughs> I just want to say the astronomy had better be freaking right. Okay? I, don't, I do not want to see the moon hanging at the wrong angle yeah. over the equator or I mean, the horizon, you know. Not really any night maps, so. Not really. Yeah, so don't have to oh, worry about I, that. I, yeah, that would be great well, if they. I, I think a couple scenario ones. Yeah. But, yeah. Well, if they. Uh, it's kind of a funny thing because astronomy really does help you at sea and uh, the funny thing was our last trip that we took was from uh, Southampton, England to Cape Town, South Africa so way th from 50 degrees north to 34 south on the earth and I had all this time with the passengers up on deck uh, talking about astronomy and once they got some of this stuff they could tell me where we were every night by going up on deck hmm. they were telling me so they were going, oh, well, Orion's right there. Okay, we're crossing the equator in another night or two. Nice. Or, or the moon, that's not right. We're upside down. <laughs> and well, we were. Yeah. Bottom of the earth, you know. Um, so <laughs> that kind of stuff is the stuff I'd be looking for here. And all my friends from this last sailing would, would instantly know if things are wrong or upside down. Yeah. So you're saying if we tried to uh, sub this in for actual footage, that it, you would not be fooled? Well, I mean, yeah, unless you got it right. Which, it, which can happen. Which can happen. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, one of the things that makes people get it right without thinking about it is if they've ever looked at the real world, um, people sometimes will know which way the moon is supposed to be, the, the man in the moon, the face. They'll always turn it right side up. Because they've seen it that way. Right. Or, like, it's an evening moon that's setting in the west. Uh, they'll know which angle to turn it to the horizon because it's only supposed to happen one way. Um, meaning for all of our nice friends who shoot Xena, Warrior Princess, I instantly can tell it was shot in the southern hemisphere because the moon is upside down, the sunset is wrong, everything's freaked out. But the Kiwis who are putting the show together, they don't know that. Right. But it's wrong for us. So, you know, I'm, I don't want people to think I'm hard to get along with because of the whole astronomy thing. <laughs> no, I, I'm cool with it. If your moon is upside down, all right, you know, it's a choice. You, 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 you have your moon oriented however you want to. I'm good with that. But there is a right way and there is a wrong way. That's what I'm trying to say. So it's just... This is where I'm at. It's just the fault in our stars. Yes, the <laughs> fault is in your stars. <laughs> Absolutely, Caesar. Yeah, it's... that's that's quite right. Sigh. Sigh. <laughs> well, actually, you know, at least in, in one historical maritime context, I may have made an important discovery based on astronomy, and I'm not I'm still not sure about this. But there are people who say they saw and they knew the Titanic broke in two. People who were there that day. They said, I know, I saw it, I drew it that way. Mm -hmm. Jack Thayer, if you're checking at home, folks. The guy who reportedly shows it breaking in a drawing. But um, there's some people who say, absolutely not, have no clue. Um, it so happens during the moment after the lights go out, the ship's about to sink. The Sagittarius, again Sagittarius, Milky Way, is rising behind the ship in the southeast. My supposition is that people who were to the northwest in a lifeboat could still see the Titanic. Its silhouette against the stars, some people saw the silhouette break because they had a glow behind the ship. The people on the other side 
There was just a hole in the stars the other way. The people looking to the northwest only saw a place where there weren't stars. They wouldn't have reported it. Mm -hmm. So I'm still chasing that one to see which lifeboat, which person was in, and which side of the ship they were on. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, I may have answered why some people saw it and didn't. So there, that's a use for astronomy, apart from trivia night at the Red Lobster. <laughs> there, there is a reason. I'll tell you what it's not good for was meeting girls. Astronomy, <laughs> that, that's how it was sold to me. And that, that's, that's a ripoff. That doesn't work. So, just saying. Just to let you know, Danny, your laptop's on 6% power. All right, well, let's see. We've been going for an hour and a half. Do we want to keep going? Or? Well, I, I mean, you know, eventually I'll have to go annoy other people. Yeah, but, you know, um, eventually we'll run out of stories. <laughs> no, 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 that will never happen. <laughs> I mean, for the last hour, I've just been making them up. I, mean, I can keep going. Uh, uh, have you ever hypnotized a water buffalo? <laughs> That's not a real story either, but I could keep going with it. <laughs> we have fun on board. We're yeah. Just, we're just making it clear we're a fun group of people, all right? We're all fun guys. We are. Yep. We're mushrooms. Sigh. Well, and of course, also another reason why wouldn't be quite so obvious that Titanic broke apart is it did not actually do in the movie where it went up. Oh, obviously. Oh, no, no, no. I mean, it's a huge exaggeration. Yeah. It's just the banana would have bent. Right. If it happened at the surface, some people still maintain it's a little below the surface, but if you did actually see a deviation in the shape of the ship with that noise, you might have made that connection in your mind. Right. If you had enough silhouette to see it happening. Yeah. But that's the only way I can think of where you'd be able to actually see anything, is if the Milky Way was there, your eyes would have to adjust, but if you're in a really dark location like that, the stars are actually brilliant. Um, I found my, my lost car keys on the ground by starlight only once. So it's a diffuse, weird, creepy light from everywhere, but it is brighter than you'd think. Would, um, do you think that might also be a reason why... Um the Japanese never saw Washington as she snuck up on Kirishima? Yeah, you could get bad luck uh, in your star field. And I could actually, if we, if we go back and run the dates uh, for that battle and give me a bearing, mm -hmm. I can actually use a computer program I've got, which I recommend to everybody called Starry Night Pro. It's very, very reasonably priced, and it lets you do historical look-arounds at any time. And in the future, too. But if I looked at that direction, and I saw, for example, constellations like Aquarius or Cancer, there's nothing there. It right. is dark. Right. So if she was in a hole, then you'd say, just by stupid luck, there's nothing to see. You might not notice those stars wink out. But if you had a brilliant constellation like Cygnus the Swan, the Milky Way would come down and here comes this big black thing at me. You'd notice it in a heartbeat. Right. So we could get a surprise like that. When you use it as a test case, give me the dates, I'll do a check, and let's see if the Washington was coming up from a hole or against a bright backdrop. Okay. So that that's a, a good one. And you folks at home, play along with the home version of our game. So... It's something we could try loading up here at some point. Yeah. Actually, that. it mm -hmm. is an extremely yeah. good idea because with all the science education stuff that we're doing here, yeah. uh, we can talk about uh, historical circumstances for the ship and even how celestial navigation works. Those programs we We, be we got a laptop and um, did yeah. that for the Dreadnought game. That's true. Excellent idea. That's one of those, uh, those chance things we use with the dice. It's like a mm -hmm. whole bunch of things that could affect the battle. You bet it could. So I see Danny has gone British. Yeah. And Good Sean man, has Sean. just posted the yep. uh, link to the uh, software for those guys who Outstanding. wanted to along at home. Thank you, Sean. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate it. Yeah, I've used that one for years and years and years and years. Um... In fact, actually, for our Titanic fans out there, I found out which star exactly was directly over the iceberg at the moment they approached. And uh, there was one, a bright one, 
in pra- in fact it probably distracted uh, the crew <laughs> in the crow's nest no joke I, I think it did um, but they may have seen the iceberg by light reflected off the top of the berg by this one star which is called Procyon if you need its name Washington versus Ah, working working out the dates for that. I oh, am. Yeah. Um. Oh. Uh, oh, I'm gonna be dead yep. soon. And that is life in a British cruiser. Well, yeah. They are made of citadels. <laughs> <laughs> oh, of course, they get torpedoes as well. Am I the only guy who wants to watch the sinkings? <laughs> I mean, they say don't watch the sinkings. Uh, I'd like permission to watch the sinkings. Because I like those more than anything else. Sinking is the most interesting thing a ship can do. <laughs> That's one way to put it. I can't help it. I'm sorry. That's a... The only reason I got involved with ships at all was because I saw the Poseidon Adventure when I was a kid. I didn't know they made ships. To know what a ship was. So I have the date. Um, November 14th, 1942. Okay. The night. 14 to 15. What time? It, That's it the tricky part. Is... Examining Wikipedia, which may be a bit of a problem. From 2330 to 0200. Ooh, all right. Um, trying to wrap my head around which uh, which stars would be up at that time. I'd have to double check. I mean, I really shouldn't shoot from the hip that way. They'll take away my artistic license. Um, <laughs> It's one of our standard three jokes in art. And so, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so this is what we do. We just yeah, just kinda kinda go sit off. here and yeah. blow, blow things up. Blow All things right. up, have people tell their stories, and well, that's you know. cool. The the hard part is, of course, the timing because Saturdays we don't have too many people bored or they're busy doing something. Right. We keep wanting to have Gunny up here. Oh, I bet. Yeah. He'll talk and talk yep. and. Of course. I have awesome stories, but he's yeah. usually, if he's here, he's the tour lead, so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you guys involving me in your, your warfare and <laughs> conversation. <laughs> and yeah. we are happy that you were able to join us. We were actually waiting and waiting and waiting to hear back from you, uh, that you were back from your trip so that we can have you on here, and then uh, you caught... Yeah. Some massive creeping credit. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, I did. Yeah, it's it's funny. I survived the trip just fine, but uh, yeah, we had a bug go around the ship, and I was bedridden for a, a good four. Oh gosh, four or five days. I'm still getting over it, but it's worth it. See the world. I just got linked the PDF of the. Um Battleship Action, 14, 15 November, 1942. Outstanding. I, I really will check it out from an astronomical standpoint. Uh, it, w- it would be fun. Um, because it is a long enough period of time, this sounds like about three hours, uh, that means the sky is going to rotate quite a bit. Mm-hmm. And, of course, we also have to set for that latitude, so we're a little bit south of the equator there. 15, course, 20 degrees south. South Dakota was spotted. Yeah. Um, and whaled on, but Washington was not. Yeah. And I wonder if... Well, what, what I'm going to start with, what I, I'll, I'll produce some images first with compass bearings on them of the sky at the start, the middle, and the end of the action, mm-hmm. and then not read the action reports except for those numbers, and then we can look and you can plot them on there. You say, right here is where she's coming from, this is where the Japanese are, to see who had any advantage but we also have to look at the weather because if the answer is we're socked in there's no point right but 
I'd be, I'd be intrigued to see if there's something to it. And then, of course, if we find out there's some amazing thing we've discovered, then I have to paint it. So, add it to the list. Yeah, add it to the <laughs> list. Well, you know, you get it. You get compulsive about this after a while. I see Danny is commencing the denting to death. Oh, yeah. there we go. But there. I'm dead. Yeah. All right, let's see if it has any cool. If it sinks in a cool way. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah. Every so often they like split in half. Yeah, I know. It's what I was uh, thinking. I mean, it's looking like it's just gonna go down. Oh. Boo. Oh, hey, oh, there oh, it goes. What? All right. Is she gonna <laughs> roll over? Maybe. Maybe. Uh, All right. What What I'd like is every once in a while if they just have a good magazine explosion when you go over, <laughs> you know, like HMS Barham, kind of unexpected explosion, whatever else. <laughs> Maybe they could animate sharks in. You know, <laughs> so you see all the guys getting eaten in the water. Uh, uh, that's, Indianapolis. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, if it had <laughs> never happened, it would be amusing, but unfortunately, it did happen. Yeah. Um, well, there she goes. Who uh, was this? Which cruiser was this? Minotaur. Minotaur, Minotaur all right. A, um, I think, fictional. Yeah, British I was going to say, yeah, I, I don't know Minotaur. Yeah, war, uh, war game, the, the company in charge fills in tech trees sometimes with... Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, yeah, once I saw, you know, Friedrich the, the Great or whatever, I mean... Yeah. I was like, uh, wait a minute. <laughs> in anything in the German line after Bismarck. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, I'm willing to give it to them. If it was designed, then they can go ahead and fulfill the design. I don't mind Montana being present. Right. I'm okay with that. But, again, I still want the chicken button that I can push, say... <laughs> Teach me a, a lesson, not yeah. just show me a fun time. Yeah. Um, well, what, what's the operation? That's the uh, that's the French one. Okay. Um, for the uh, actually, you can. Okay. Do we have? Mexicola, Indy, Fiji, and Algier. We don't have um, Atlanta. We can't use it. I think. We, no, we, we can. Uh, we don't have it. Then? I don't know, because uh, Atlanta could be used. Or at least I've seen Atlantis. Maybe we don't have it then. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, you know, you can have a nuclear-armed supersonic Zeppelin. Um, <laughs> you know, since since we're at it. Um, Why not? But, yeah, I just, I can't go there. Yeah. Fun stuff, though. This is actually the uh, the one with doubloons as a reward. Oh, all right, that's cool. I like doubloons. Let's see how this goes for. Him. Yeah, I mean, probably not good. <laughs> Does it ever? <laughs> eh, worth a shot. <laughs> so you're getting more uh, more info to use. Yeah, um, the war damage report. From South Dakota. Yeah, you'll probably get a lot of stuff in there that's really good about uh, bearings in action reports. I get a lot of that. Yeah. Uh, which which direction the the danger came from or whatever. Uh, One kind of crazy report. Have you seen the um, the Bu ships uh, analysis of Hornet? No. When she was sunk at Santa Cruz. No. I really wish I'd, I'd had this game back when I was doing that commission on the Fletcher and ships like that yeah. because I was I was Very going hard, from blueprints yeah. and different photographs and things like that different angles yeah. and the problem was for that particular one with the torpedo going under I had to be viewing the ship from an angle she was never photographed at Yeah. and I was almost desperate enough to buy a Fletcher plastic kit and <laughs> literally shoot it myself from the correct angle 
Uh, but I ended up having to eyeball it. And man, that was a nightmare. Mm. Um, Ooh, there's this one of Franklin. Oh, yeah. <laughs> a fixer upper. assassinate all the things <laughs> yeah that's kind of a do-over at that point yeah yeah um, but like it included such things as like debris bouncing through the hangar deck and so on sure Yeesh. yeah it's amazing the repairs that were done on some ships. Now, with Franklin, she retired after this, did she not? She, she was never um, fully reconditioned. I don't know, actually. Yeah, as I mean, it was so bad, and it was right at the end. They wouldn't have needed her. Yeah. So. Washington opened fire uh, on Kirshima at 0100. Ceasefire was given at 0107. Mm -hmm. She appears to be general... To have been generally south to south south east, south southeast of Kirishima. Okay, that's that. That'll be enough for us to uh, to tell. Yeah, but yeah, this weekend I'll check it out, and then you'll be able to have a follow-on report, maybe with artwork. You know, <laughs> if if you can show, if you can show things that are on your computer, which yeah. you so clearly are. Yeah. And then, you know, we can actually get the images of the stars and show uh, Washington coming up. Right. So it's kind of a kind of a fun challenge for me. Well, I'll have to have your, your viewers submit things to <laughs> check them out. Okay. Yeah. As That's long it. as it does not involve the pyramids or the face on Mars. All right. <laughs> right. <laughs> I got that, some that, limits. That's where you draw the line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that that's definitely another segment we can have on just uh, looking oh, yeah. up st uh, stars and, and Christine artwork. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's... Well, yeah, actually we could. That'd be kind yeah. of fun. As obscure as that is. Yeah. Um, I'm sure that would find a, a its own group of... Uh, yeah, a niche audience and get yeah. some really new and unusual people. Um, which... Which has happened to me yeah. many, many times. Yeah, if you if you stray into those waters, you'll get people that have been to many planets who will come to your <laughs> art shows. Um, oh my god, I, I, I'm thinking of someone in particular. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, this, you know, uh, I'm, I, I'm this, sure all of us have this guitar. No, no, like a guitarist is band, uh, cynic Paul Masvidal. He's Super into aliens and stuff. Yeah. It's hilarious. I'm just like, what? You're the same person that writes all this awesome music. <laughs> you know, it's kind of funny. I've got a buddy of mine named Dale. Dale, out there in New Mexico. Yes, I know you're still out there. Uh, who's an artist. And he and I had a conversation over many, many, many Tucati, Tucatis somewhere in Albuquerque. And we divided up the astronomical world into what we would paint and the stuff he wanted was pyramids flying saucers and the face <laughs> on mars and the the thing was he kind of got known for being the face on mars art guy and he was making a boatload of cash off all these things and then nasa went up shot a picture of the thing and it's just a hill <laughs> and he actually sent me out a note and he says what am i going to do and so the answer was just keep painting it so it looks like the face of a baboon or jesus or whatever it needs to yeah. be so you can still sell prints. And so caveat emptor out there, people, when you gotta remember art is a business and people will sell what sells. Franklin was completely repaired, but not before the end of the war. Okay. She, like Bunker Hill, were kept in reserve post war because they were in such good shape, it was felt that giving them the new refits in the early fifties compared to the beat up ones that need repair Mm -hmm. um, it trails off and I guess uh, wasn't worth it uh, and then they were considered the least valuable because they hadn't been modernized and were just scrapped so so it goes got to scrap all the new work they'd done that's yep. a shame I'm surprised they didn't sell them to some other country I mean we did do that with a lot of them Yeah. Uh, famously you remember the cruiser that was sunk during the Falklands 
right? Uh, Phoenix. Yes, the former USS Phoenix. Mm-hmm. Which became the General Belgrano. Yes. Last, probably the last World War II ship casualty that ever happened. Probably. Most likely. Yeah, I'm thinking. 1982. Or 81, whatever it was. 82, I think. 82. Yeah. Alright, so next week we're hoping Sean has the video done, right? Yeah. Hopefully. And that'll be our stream, because I'm going to be out to something. Nick, you're going to be out as yeah, well. Because it's my birthday, and my dad is taking me to view tennis, because uh, that's totally what I want to do for my birthday, Dad. <laughs> um, but... There will be a therapy session for Nick yeah. regarding family issues hey, a little later. Hey, hey. <laughs> you have some father anger issues, don't you? And he took me to tennis, but I wanted to. I wanted he a wanted me to go into the <laughs> There we go. There we go. We just let it all out here on the, the live stream. I, I know I feel better. I, I hope. And All we, of you at home do too. And we just lost two viewers. <laughs> well, that's it. They're checking out. Yes, well. Yeah. It's because I'm not interesting enough. I don't do fun paintings with the stars. And, uh, <laughs> well, if you're, not, if you're not interesting enough, you just make it up. Mm. Kidding, of course. Everything I've told you is completely true. I was about to say, we're, we're just going to leave that hanging. <laughs> So I guess next time you're going to have like a greatest hits show, right? Uh, so yeah, it's since a, you it's, guys are going to be out doing. Yeah, it's you're the, going to do fun stuff, and yeah, he's going to be it's doing the, this yeah, the other the seventy fifth uh, like anniversary podcast. We were trying to yeah. release the the video. Okay. Um, but you know, with uh, Sean having stuff going on and technical issues, it's kind of delayed us. Right. That and it was our own fault because we took a while to start the video. <laughs> yeah. We we should have allotted more time to having it. Uh, getting it edited and everything. So. Yeah. That was our fault. But um, hopefully that'll be done and we'll use that as a stream. We'll just upload it and have it ready mm -hmm. to go. Mm -hmm. um, and then come back the following week and let's see who we can get in here. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. Uh, do the people at home think you're actually on a battleship? They we did. we've made yeah. a yeah we, we've made they, a they think you're really on one yeah wow. we we've told them <laughs> well because we are yeah. It's a green screen. <laughs> We're in somebody's garage in New Jersey. <laughs> no, 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 I just uh, yeah. We are actually, which still takes some getting used to. Actually, yeah. I mean, here we actually are sitting on a battleship. Yeah. Um, do do other battleships have shows Not. anywhere near this fun? Not yet. They don't have Not anything yet, in this no. far as we can tell. Wow. Yeah. Well, we could go use this as kind of social pressure yeah. because it'd be great oh, yeah. fun for us to have a show back and forth. With them, yeah. we're we're ho I'm sure that uh, John Williams or someone will wheedle the um, yeah. the other uh, ships. Go, you know, neener neener. Look what we got. That we don't have. <laughs> yeah. Um, for all we know, he might be waiting for our first official podcast to do that because he did actually say that he was yeah. going to be watching that. Yeah. Well, it, it would he's, be a lot of fun. Yeah, he's he's actually really into the idea of it. I don't think he completely understands it yet. Mm -hmm. But he's definitely like that's an awesome idea, and he was yeah. go for it when we yeah. brought it up. Well, I mean, who knows? In a couple of years, we may be be able to have conversations between all these historic ships in different parts of the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how wild would that be to be able to be skyping with uh, HMS Victory? Here? Yeah, I mean, that would just <laughs> be amazing. She yeah. may be an she may be an old lady, but boy, is yeah. she up with the times. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, she's a a first rater with Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> uh, huh. It could happen. You could, it get wargaming to uh, add her in there with, along with the Constitution. Oh, I wish. <laughs> oh, that would be outrageous. To be just, awesome. just have Victory sail in there yeah. and be invincible. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so she's only got, you know, 32 pounder cannons, yeah. but you can't sink her. No. 
Do you do a tier sub one or sub two? Actually, <laughs> totally. Yeah. yeah just get do all these tier old sailing. eighteen oh five. Yeah. Yeah. I I think that would be outrageous. The one thing is though, I mean, uh, in the age of sail, naval combat is so slow. I yeah. mean, and it takes yeah. forever. Have you guys ever seen a battle, sea battle with under sail? Yeah. Watching yeah, all mean, that stuff that Constitution was releasing for the what is it two hundred and whatever yeah, anniversary yeah. of sure. I forgot what the battle was, but. Where it took on two British ships, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, they they actually do stagings of uh, pirate ship combat here in SoCal, uh, down at Newport Beach, where they will do sailing battles with a few cannons on some sailing ships, and you get one pass, and they they let loose with a couple. And it's kind of like you know, oh, I'm gonna go into town. I think I'm gonna get dinner before they come back around. Um, that wouldn't work very well for for this. You just have to. St- you know, tab, 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 tab forward to yeah. when you're in combat again. Yeah. But Time skip and fun with that. Yeah. Yeah, I do. I, I love the look and feel of these games. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun. Nice. Yeah, I'm amazed what they're able to do these yeah. days. But yeah, it, it, that would be the cool thing is if they ever started playing this and we could just play against them or with them. Yeah, yeah. well, I, I have had the idea, and I keep bringing it up, and I, I suspect it's eventually going to happen. Um, where, of course, we have many of our good friends in Japan and our mm-hmm. expert gamers, and get them to play Yamato. Yeah. Get us to play Iowa from here. And uh, just Whoa. those two on the board. After, after this, when we're offline, I'll tell you what the idea is right now for Fleet Week. That, uh, oh my gosh, all right. That, Fantastic. That Jonathan told me about, or told the, the, us about the other yeah. day. Really? The, yeah, um, ideas like this are I, going around. I think you were there. So, when you brought that's it, great. I probably forgot, but. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of historical possibilities where you can, yeah. you can combine some of this kind of fun with real uh, history teaching. Yeah. Uh, and people. And so, so that's like my thing with with games is mm-hmm. that that already was interested in history when I was younger but Age of Empires 2 yeah. yeah that was just like sure. that solidified my love with history I can, I can believe it yeah. um, I think it would be hysterical uh, if, if anything like that should occur I would like to see uh, bring in a couple people as color commentators yeah uh, so you got your gamers doing their routine but you got people covering this like a like a, an NFL game who are experts I could totally see this being done Again, I will tell you what yeah, the idea is. Listen to this. I'm just, I'm just stepping on all these landmines. Yeah. I'm sorry, but uh, um, brilliant yeah. ideas are brilliant ideas. Yeah. You know, you can't help it. Yeah, there, there's some uh, non-traditional ideas that uh, all right. Jonathan has for Fleet Week. Yeah, <laughs> but it involves like kind of the stuff we're doing right here. How fun! Um, where I'm going, like, oh yeah, I, I. I need to make sure I come back for that. <laughs> <laughs> That's great fun. Well, who knows? Maybe in three or four hundred years, this is the way we'll solve all actual uh, yeah. contests and problems. <laughs> It'll go into single combat warrior stuff like they used yeah. to do in it's... you know the Middle Ages. Except it'll be one gamer against another gamer, and we'll just... Oh, he's getting around me. No. No. <laughs> Well, swing, swing around. Yeah, there you go. There you oh, go. Barely. There you oh. go. And the flaming wreck slides uh. alongside. Outstanding. I had no idea what a good pilot you were. Well done. <laughs> Look at that uh, flaming wreck. Right. If I guns will swing around. Okay, it's done. And as usual, we don't get to see the sinking. Uh, uh, well. oh, come on, giant fire. Look at that. <laughs> You know, I went to film school. That's a shot, man. That's a barbecue. Right. Are they waiting? Huh? Er, never mind. So basically, all you gotta do left is kill that carrier right. and then survive. Will he be able to do it, folks? Let's find out. <laughs> One of the commenters says, check for paint. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Think what would Rear Admiral Jingles say? (laughs) 
patron saint. <laughs> All praise be unto he or something? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. says he would probably say brown alert. Uh, yes, he would, actually. <laughs> hey. Fantastic. All right, I think well, we're going to end this now. We're, we're at two hours. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me into yeah. your, your chamber. Yeah. I yeah, appreciate yeah. this. We'll definitely bring you back to do all that artwork and uh, oh, yeah, definitely. star yeah. stuff, all the astronomy stuff. Sounds cool. All right. Do it, Thanks for joining us, guys. See you next time. Bye. Take care.